Audacity Podcast. This is Rachel, and I'm here today with my co-host, Haley. Unfortunately, Heather could not be with us tonight while we're recording. She has had to take care of some family business, as a mother of three has to do sometimes. But we are very excited to have my and Haley's good friend, Natalie Kohler, on tonight. Thanks for having me. You Yes. Thank you so much for joining us. Natalie is our second guest ever on this podcast. Thank you. I could not be more happy than be here supporting the two of you. So when I was sitting around thinking about how I would love to introduce Natalie to this podcast, I thought of a very iconic story that I would like to tell. (laughs) No, I'm nervous. <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, stories. <laughs> well there, there are many iconic stories, but this is part of the story of how we met. So Natalie and I met over a decade ago. We were both working at a very high-volume Asian restaurant in Los Angeles. Natalie was a server at this restaurant, and I worked at the front desk. And my job there – at this very high volume, crazy restaurant was to choose where everyone is sitting. I went through the reservations every day. I decided all the walk-ins and I figured out like who's sitting where at what time. It's a lot. Yes. It's, it's a very high pressure situation. Okay? But, but as a server, exactly. you wanted to very much always be on your good side because Correct. if Correct. you weren't, you weren't going to get the parties that were going to yeah. either pay or tip well or you know right. be the money makers for the night. So. so yes. So also my position was also a very intimate position because not only do I have like these cutesy like little relationships with all the servers, but I also have to know what server can handle what who I can see where and like what the situation is. Come one day where Natalie's in this section that includes our private room at this restaurant, which has three tables, but there were no private events that day. And so I had to seat the three tables in this room where it's very tight. The tables are close together. It's very dim in there. Like it's really like a sexy place to have a cute private event. Yes. It has its own patio, whatever. But for this situation of just seating like a family, it, it was hard. So it got down to the wire of like, okay, Nally's here. I need to seat these tables. She needs to make money. And so I just start firing off like random people in there. And <laughs> I seat this table in there that is a man, a woman, and their two kids, a couple. And they didn't like their table. They really didn't like their table. They didn't like their table at all. And so the dad comes storming back up to the front. And he's like yelling at the hostesses and just being like, yeah, blah, blah, blah. So I kind of like step in. I'm like, sir, can I help you? Like, what, what can I do for you? He's like, I need to see the manager. And I'm like, okay, sure. Okay. And like, I know that I sent these people here. I know that this is a regular thing that when people go back there, they hate it. They come yelling. So I'm just like, okay, I'm like, let me, let me do like the, my canned response for this thing. Right. Yeah. It's like, you're the kid getting shoved in the back of the class. Like no one really wants Correct. to like, you know, no sit one in the wants corner. to sit there. No one wants no, to sit so. there. It's, it's bad. It, and I, I'll be honest, it's bad, you know, but if you want to eat with us, 12 people have to eventually sit there. Right. Totally. So, but also Janie and Jim were none too pleased that they went to this elaborate restaurant and were only given a spot in the corner. Uh, Correct. But anyways. I digress. Someone's eventually got to sit there. Anyway, so the guy comes yelling. The manager comes up. The dad's like, I want an apology, blah, 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 like yelling, screaming. And I'm like, I'm just going to go get Natalie and um, I'm going to have – like, let's have her apologize. And, like, the manager's like, Natalie needs to apologize. And I was like, okay, look, like, I'm going to go talk to her. So I go talk to Natalie. I was like, look, like, like, I was really mad. It's 97% my fault. Can you just go apologize so, like, they'll leave, right? And so the way that the restaurant is, the front, like, a long corridor, and there, there's a corner that goes into the restaurant. And Natalie f- comes around the corner. She looks the man in the eye, and she does this curtsy, very dramatic curtsy. And she goes, I'm sorry. And then she whips her hair around, and she walks back over. <laughs> and that was the end of it. And that was the end of it. And I was just like, I was standing there. I was like, yeah, she did it. And the Oscar uh, goes too. Yeah, I was <laughs> like, really? wow. I was like, yeah, like she really you did curtsied? it. 
She curtsied. Me, yeah, I fully curtsied. I'll paint another like color on top of this a story to sort of really, really button it and send it home. Yeah. Um, this gentleman <laughs> was like, not, not only so like rabidly angry at, that he was put in the corner, but yeah. mind you, like it looked like he and his wife and his children had been like walking around downtown Disney all day and like hadn't eaten. So it was like they were malnourished, angry they got put back in the corner. Also mad because I was like snarky with them in the corner, like trying to get their food order. And I was like, sir, I'm just trying to take your order. So he wasn't liking any of that. And so he blamed all of the current circumstances on me and it was my fault. So then I became the server at fault for all of this. But at that point I had zero fucks left to give. And Mm -hmm. so (laughs) the manager was just like, just apologize. And so (laughs) to, to top it off, and to uh, back Rachel's story up. Yeah, I was like, okay, I'm going to give the fakest apology that I possibly Your construct. honor. In the history of apologies, so I yes, thought it was so good. In my in my true theatrical ways, I opened my arms, I bowed and curtsied, and I said, "I'm sorry." <laughs> and I yes. went around and walked back away. It was that, so good, though. And that, ladies and gentlemen, was the beginning, middle, and end of my career as a server. Um, we get into the whole podcast separate, talking about the ridiculousness of restaurants and working in one and trying to actually get seated somewhere in Los I'm, Angeles. I know. Very happy I never was in a restaurant. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Well, you're very lucky to have never have done that. Oh, but I'm blessed with retail. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Fair. I've done both, and I will say, actually, good point. Yeah. yeah fair point. <laughs> Let me go ahead and introduce my good friend, Natalie, because you haven't got the appropriate Mm. introduction that you deserve. Natalie is a Southern California native, originally from Huntington Beach, correct? Yes. Born and raised. Sunny SoCal, HB. And then you went to Fullerton, right? I went to Cal State Fullerton. I did. And you studied I studied theater. You couldn't tell. (laughs) Yeah. I'm like, from the dramatics. A flair for the dramatics is- uh, Yes. You've seen a lot of performances. Yes, we have. (laughs) Haley and I have gone so many performances, which we love, but I'm- I am so happy to say that Natalie has really been able to use her foundational years in theater, like channel that into an amazing career as an agent. And so now you are a talent agent for both commercial and theatrical, correct? Yes. And yeah. theatrical is television, film, and live theater. You've really thrived in that. It's been three years doing both, uh, running both departments, and I'm I'm alive and kicking. <laughs> Yeah. Well, I know that you've had so much success. Like you've had your clients have a lead on Broadway. You've had amazing commercial placements like during Super Bowl, Grammys. Your clients have been featured in TV shows. And so you really have your feet wet when it comes to working actors in your industry. Like you really understand Yeah. And understand that this business is not for the faint of heart, especially in this sort of climate that we're in. We're still sort of coming off a pandemic and coming off uh, two major strikes in the business. And, you know, we're still absolutely recouping from those. So, you know, I was fortunate where some weren't while you know, the theatrical division was sort of pushed to the wayside due to the strikes, you know, I still had a thriving commercial department. So, yeah. you know, I was able to sort of keep afloat, fortunately, uh, while others weren't. So I'm very grateful <laughs> for also being <laughs> given the opportunity to sort of run both departments because I don't think I would have a job if I was just wanting to run one and not the other. So yeah, so I remember when you got this job, which was such a big deal, yeah. and you were building out a whole new department at the company that you're at right now. Yeah. What was that like? Like you literally got hired to build out a whole new department. Yeah. It was scary. You know, I think it would have been a safe choice to sort of choose someone that already had a well-established roster and working actors. And, you know, I had a sort of tiny musical theater department uh, that sort of came with me, so to say. But, you know, I was given the opportunity to sort of build from the ground up, which is very rarely, if ever, given and sort of uh, allowed without sort of 
starting from zero, so to say. So they're like, here, here's a salary, go build a department. So I had to sort of sink or swim and kind of call on my my own sort of roster of manager friends and casting director friends. And, you know, obviously the talent pool that I sort of already knew just being sort of an associate and an assistant in the agency business, you know, obviously I knew a lot of actors. So the, you know, three years up until pandemic was me sort of building the, the department, the t- TV film and theater department. So a lot was put on my shoulders very quickly, but I think that's sort of where I thrive in sort of this uh, environment that it's sort of sink or swim. And that's sort of something that I really am proud of myself for doing. You know, I think a lot of folks might mm-hmm. not have been able to sort of have the the bandwidth or the wherewithal to sort of understand this business. And, you know, I learned from some of the best. First couple of agencies I worked for were for some agents that really knew this business and really taught me a lot. And so I owe a lot of what I have learned from them. And so you learn from the best. And if you learn from the best, you sort of can be the best. So, mm-hmm. you know, I sort of took what I liked from their dials and I adapted and sort of created my own. And, you know, now I sort of have a voice and casting likes me and likes my taste and you know yeah. they're seeing my clients they're killing it I know I love that <laughs> you they know. trust your vision like they know yes. that the when vision. they hire yeah they know that when they hire one of your actors someone that's signed with you they understand what they're gonna get right they there's an expectation of what is actually gonna happen and like yeah. I think that's great Correct. And this business is truly built on, you know, taste and acting, obviously. Listen, uh, first and foremost, you know, the art of acting. They can all act, though. They can all act. (laughs) Um, You know, (laughs) yes and no. (laughs) But yes, essentially, yes. We can all be actors if we want to because we're just playing a part. But sort of understanding the craft and the knowledge of sort of what it takes to be that is not just sort of being an actor anymore. You know, you really are the COO or the CEO of your own company. So to backtrack a little, yes, you know, I my reputation is purely built on sort of my own sort of resume. And then my resume is my my roster of actors and sort of what they've booked. So, you know, uh, very proud of that. Yeah. Um, I'm not sure if anyone knows this, but I'm actually signed with Natalie. Oh. <laughs> Yet, to <laughs> Yet to book busy. Yet to book anything. But you remember when you said that again for me? Yeah, it's like, so funny. I was like, Haley, they're looking for stylists. I said, oh, like actual stylists for a commercial. And I am I will always be the type of person, if, like if I know someone, like my little brother's a golfer, I'll put him in for golf spots. My older brother's a teacher, I would put him in for teacher spots. You know, I was like, oh, a stylist. I was like, oh, I have that. Haley is my friend. So I, like, I can do that. I was like, Haley, you can just like act like a, be a stylist, right? Like yeah, they want a real not. stylist. So she, at that point, she wasn't really acting – she was just being herself and Haley's got a great personality. So Haley, I mean, we could we could talk about more or doing more commercial spots if that's something you're into. I'm kind yeah. of down. Yeah. I yeah, just want to be on the big screen. Speaking of Haley wants to be on the big screen, basically a little over one year ago, Haley and I got drunk. <laughs> Imagine that. Surprise, surprise. Surprise, right? surprise. Two like 34-year-olds <laughs> with no kids nothing to do at night out (laughs) drinking and we just started recording ourselves talking for no fucking reason I don't know I think I just like set up my phone and push record and we start blabbing blabbing talking to people doing a whole thing we were acting like we were e-news hosts we were going around interviewing excellent I would like to see that footage personally yeah maybe one day we'll post it it was It was. I'm unhinged. happy to offer feedback too. If you it guys need to help, unhinged. need help with your self tapes. I'm all. I'm no, right there. For Natalie, you. you don't even understand. We're going up to strangers, <laughs> being like, "How do you feel about the band?" And like recording yeah. it. Basically, we were like acting so unhinged. Like I, I was like, "We're with E News." I was so serious. <laughs> yeah, I would have believed it. I would have been, been like, like, "Okay, you can't believe us." <laughs> you yeah. So if unhinged. the two of you came up to me and were like, "Hey, so we'd love to hear your feedback," we'd be like, "I'd be like, okay, yeah, here we go." <laughs> We are asking people like pose with like this little fish thing. Like it was – there's a lot going on. But yeah. I was telling her like exactly like basically one year ago, we recorded ourselves talking and we're like, that's pretty oh. good. Yeah. Like, there you go. Well, that was kind of fun. And then tomorrow we're flying to New York and I was like, you know, yeah. our, our, the whole point of us going to New York right now is to like record ourselves talking. Yeah. <laughs> Just like do, drinking stuff. <laughs> 
I'm going to be on Times Square, literally. Yeah. If someone one year ago when like this one thing <laughs> happened where we started recording ourselves could be like, yeah, in one year, you're going to have a podcast. You're going to be <laughs> flying to New York to record yourselves, like drink martinis. I would have been like, what the fuck? <laughs> That'll go over real well, especially in New York City. So <laughs> Natalie, I lived in LA for over a decade and – as we've talked about, I worked very heavily in food and beverage. And during that time, I met so many actors. <laughs> and I've learned so much about the industry. That's one of the reasons why we wanted to bring you on today. Because I don't feel like enough people understand the brutality of the acting industry and the fact that casting calls and auditions and all of that, like, it isn't really what people outside of the industry think it is. And so I kind of want to talk about that today. And I want to talk about the cycle of rejection because there's so much rejection in the acting industry. So I would love for you just to explain to our listeners who are majority not in this industry, not even close to being in this industry, what it's like for the average actor going to work each day and having to go to an audition. Huh. Well, there's a twofold here. I'll tell you what it used to be like, and I'll tell you what it's like now. Before COVID, when I started working as an assistant uh, at a boutique agency, the day was filled with auditioning. And you would get notified via email and a phone call from your agent that you, you know, and I can only sort of speak to my specific agency that I was working at when I first got started, that you would have either, you know, maybe one or two commercial auditions, maybe in the morning and or maybe like one theatrical audition um, in the evening. So, you know, someone that considered themselves a working actor in sort of both fields would would have their day filled of driving around, making it to their auditions, agents are getting time frames, you know, you were given sides for your audition maybe the night before, you know, if it was a guest star, maybe you had two days, three days, you know, or you didn't and you had one day and it was eight pages and you sort of had to just take it with you and sort of do your best. Um, commercial auditions are a little quicker, you know, sometimes they're aside, sometimes they're not, you know, you show up to the audition, uh, you fill your name in, you're in the waiting room with the cattle call of, uh, you know, maybe there's 10 commercials being cast that day. And now there's 50 to hundred people in the waiting room. So the day was filled with auditioning and it was exciting. So that's what it was sort of like before it all sort of <laughs> made the switch, so to say. So over the years, sort of with the advent of, you know, switching over to streaming services, the amount of content that was there doubled and tripled. You know, we, Netflix came about and, you know, then the HBO sort of moved online and Hulu and it was no longer just network television. So what the, you know, common actor was used to was the seasons. So, you know, you had your pilot season, which, you know, fell between January and about April. And pilot mm -hmm. season was traditional network pilot seasons. And the networks are uh, CBS, NBC, ABC, Fox would have your bulk of your majority of the new shows being cast during that time. So if you were a new actor coming to the business, you know, you would you would sort of be like, oh, I'm coming to LA for pilot season to hopefully book a pilot. And that would sort of perhaps launch your career. Then you have hiatus and then you have episodic season that would start back up from about probably end of July. You know, you'd have a good solid eight months of show shooting when it had 20 to 22 to 23 episodes. So that all has sort of gone away. So let's sort of fast forward to COVID time. So COVID, and, and honestly, even before COVID hit, uh, the the advent of the self tape sort of came about. So yeah, I was uh, going to ask you about that in this conversation. Um, self tape really sort of changed the landscape of what it really meant to be an actor and sort of what you what your day to day was. So your day to day now, you know, since this the advent of self tapes can be, you know, people are at home, you know. Where the you know average working person maybe would have gone up and driven and gone to work, you know the actor would have gotten up and driven to their auditions. You know now now everyone's at home and everyone's making their auditions at home. So you know some people thrive in it and some people do not. So it just, depending on the type of actor you are and how much you sort of been in this business and how you've adapted, you know it's like Darwinism. You know <laughs> survival of the fittest. Those that have sort of adapted to this new sort of wave of self taping have you know. You choose to love it or you hate it and you sort of – it's a nature of the beast right now. The rejection in the industry has sort of 
altered for the actor. You know, you would get up and go to these auditions and sort of, you know, be there and be in it all day long. And, you know, you would go and sort of be able to perform and do your thing and then go home. And, you know, listen, you were probably getting told yes a lot more back in the day because there was so much more out there versus today. Now you're one of you know, you're one actor in a submission of 5,000 and maybe you're one of 50 tapes for a co-star and, you know, casting, you know, casting's absolutely watching all these tapes. You know, they're not in the business of sending someone a self tape and not watching it. But now the actor is at home performing their auditions into nothing. And now um, I'm sending off this tape to, you know, the the casting directors and my agents and, and that's it. And so, you know, the rejection has sort of altered a little bit. So, you know, from my conversations with my own actors, you really have to have a very strong sense of self and not let this business get to you because, you know, here, like, what am I doing? I'm sending tape after tape after tape after tape after tape and I'm not booking. Well, what am I doing? So I have to tell my actors constantly, you know, I had a, a text thread with one of my girls today and she's like, I just like, I'm in a rut. I don't know what I'm doing, you know, I'm sending all these tapes off and nothing's happening. And I say, it's sort of where we're at now with the business. You know, I believe in you, your agent should be your number one fan. You have a manager, you know, your manager is too. So we're your hype people. So, you know, actors really have to have a very strong sense of self and, um, you know, individualism. So during moments where, you know, you really are sort of getting beaten up. Like I have literally sent hundreds and hundreds of tapes. I have to be able to sort of look within myself and say, look, I can either withstand this business and continue to do what I do or throw in the towel. So rejection is constant. Can I ask you from what I understand from like my friends in LA, part of the casting experience is that casting directors are looking for a specific look feel vibe from people and essentially the entire casting call is them just like looking for that specific person. Can you speak a little bit to that and like what that experience is like for your actors? Casting has an idea of what they want when they put out a breakdown for the roles that they're looking for, either ethnicity or gender or age range or, you know, it's like you're an article of clothing. You know, when you walk into a store and you have no idea sort of what you're looking to buy, but you have blue shirts, you have black shirts, you have green shirts, you have jeans, you have uh, jeans with studs, you have jeans that are ripped and torn. So, and you don't have any idea what you're looking for. But you know when you see it that it is it. So yes, we're talking about humans in this instance. But the beauty of it is the casting process itself is sort of exploratory. They often have an idea of what they're looking for, but someone could come in and completely change their mind. The sort of unfortunate incident is that the likeliness that it's going to be you is probably slim. But one day, it will be you. And that's sort of the beauty of what sort of the acting business hold is that at some point you're going to come in and knock their socks off or you're going to change their mind. And that's sort of going to be the actor's story to sort of, you know, live off of. At some point you are going to be it. And I think if you have the bandwidth and the wherewithal to sort of stay in this business, you have to realize that you're talented, that you believe in yourself, that you have a good team and the training you're continuing to train, you know, at some point you're going to walk through that door and you are going to be what casting wants. And I hope that that journey happens sooner than most for my actors. <laughs> So, you know, it's a, it's a tough game. Yeah. Well, so at large, it is a lot of rejection for most actors every day are getting more rejections than they get confirmations, right? Like, yeah, Yeah, I mean, the business is 99% rejection and 1%, you know, sort of, yeah, you got the job. You're it this, you're it today. Like, how do you amp up your actors to like keep going to auditions and to keep in the game like how do people keep doing it even if you've never booked anything big like you've never got that validation that confirmation like how do people keep doing it you know it is the crazy love for this business and the love of acting hopefully you have a 
really great support system at home. You know, your significant other sort of understands what you're doing. They believe in you. Your agent believes in you. Your manager believes in you. Your mom believes in you. Your sister believes in you. You believe in you. To sort of combat the symphony of rejection, you have to sort of push through and persevere yourself because that's sort of all it is. And like I said, at some point, hopefully it breaks and you know, at some point you sort of realize this is this is what I want to do and I'm in it for the long haul. Or like I said, you throw in the towel. Can I uh, ask you guys something? Yes. What is the biggest rejection that you've faced in your life? Or maybe not the biggest, but what is a story or like something like where you personally faced rejection? I think for me, most formative, you know, keeping with sort of the performance theme of it, what kind of shaped my decision to sort of decide to kick the bucket as far as uh, continuing to perform myself was college. College was an extremely difficult time for me. And I, I went to a performing arts college and that was supposed to be an area where you're, you know, it, it honestly, college was just an extension of high school, you know, especially for yeah. someone like myself who had no, I had no idea who they were, you know, I, they didn't know sort of what job they wanted. You know, you go to college and you hope that all these people have the answers and they're going to tell you what to do. So I got thrown into this performing arts program thinking, you know, okay, this is, this is what I want to do. You know, all these people are going to give me the right tools to sort of learn to be a performer and all these acting classes. And I was only met with rejection. So immediately before I even began what I thought was going to be a performing arts program was immediately met with, oh, you're not good enough to do this. (laughs) So here I was a performer uh, myself, you know, auditioning and, you know, doing plays outside of school, but school was telling me I wasn't good enough. It was hard for me to sort of get through college and say my school, which is supposed to be this beacon of learning and sort of doing the things was only giving me rejection. You know, it was really tough kind of getting through those years, but, you know, it definitely kind of shaped me and sort of gave me a thicker skin. So yeah, I can't imagine like paying to be somewhere to like learn stuff and they're like, you're not good enough to be here. Sorry. Yeah. Like, whatever. Oh my God. <laughs> that, that sounds so fucked up actually. Yeah. Oh my God. Yeah. But you know, again, we persevere and it no, was- No, we persevere, it, but whoa, I personally couldn't do it. I could never be in like the acting industry period, but like that situation I could not be in. But do you think that that's more generational? Like, cause I feel like in general, like even like when I was in college, I feel like it was just a harsher world. Yeah. Where like now Absolutely. I don't think that it's- Yeah, like it's harsh. Same. Yeah. I don't know why, <laughs> but like it makes me think of that, um, the movie, I can't, Think of what it's called, but like it's like the ballet or like the dance movie. Oh, or like, save the last dance. Yeah. Well, they're so hard on the the dancers. Like yes, that was the world. Like Julia Stiles one where she has the big dance at the end of, yes, the, of yes. the, Oh, it's one of the best movies of all time. Great ever. Okay. Yeah, but like yeah. I, I save the last dance. Right? Was yeah, it? Save yeah, save yeah. the last dance. But yeah. like that, I that I actually do feel like that was definitely our generation. It was a lot harsher and there weren't as many filters. And I think that people were a lot harder. Now it's it's definitely a little different. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Haley, did you ever face rejection? That was really hard. Yeah. So I obviously ran college track. I think in general, like running for Ohio State, which was like division one, nothing I did was good enough. I would never be to the caliber that I should have been, even though like if you stuck me in like any other city, I would be like the best of the best or I'd have every record. But like I think being in a division one college setting and still doing what I was doing, it was never good enough. That was really difficult because I was like giving my life to that sport and like anyone that ran over an 800 at the time had to run cross country. So I ran track, indoor, outdoor, cross country. So like a lot, but I mean, eventually like, yeah, that's why I broke my foot. Like I, you know, you can't do that much, but it's like, no matter what I was doing, like I was running 60 miles a week at minimum at times. So much. Yeah. That's outrageous. It's so crazy when I think back to that, because even what I was doing, it still wasn't enough, you know, like where you just Uh, feel like, like, yeah, you're never good enough. You're never. It's like what a, anything that I do is literally just going to be not good enough for any of these people. Yeah. As an athlete, like I had coaches who were like, "Oh, you need to do this. You need to do this. Like you're, you should be this weight and like whatever." And I would be like, "I can't 
physically lose more weight. Like I yeah. am starving. Yeah. <laughs> like yeah. I'm running so much. Like I'm literally yeah. starving. Yeah. So like I never felt like I was accomplishing anything. So I think that's a different angle maybe. But there is like an element of something that I learned about earlier today, which is self-rejection, which is when you reject yourself so that other people cannot reject you. It's like a protective Protective. thing, right? So it's like, it's a part of like giving up, but it's also a part of just not fulfilling your desires because you're scared of rejection, right? You're like, you are not putting yourself out there to the potential that you could be because you are you have anxiety afraid of failure. Or, or yeah, you're afraid of failure, so you don't even try. Which they actually say, like, fear is like the biggest thing that like makes everyone fail. Like, right? If you're too afraid to go do something, then it never gets done. Yeah, yeah. There's it's a form no of self-preservation. Way. Mm-hmm. It is, but it's also a self a form of self restriction. Yeah, a hundred percent. The biggest thing that can stop you from doing anything is fear. Obviously, if you're too afraid to try, you won't try. So then you don't even know if you could have. You could do it. Yeah. Yeah. So Nat, you have so many actors and they're constantly putting themselves out there. And nine times out of 10, if not more, it's not leading to what they feel like is success. What do you tell your actors in order to help guide them to continue on? Like, how do you, what advice do you give them to not give up, essentially, is I think what I'm asking? You know, I tell my actors in a perfect world, you just got to brush it off. And the minute you walk out that door, the minute you forget about it. So yeah. you can't take this business too personally. That's probably number one. And that is the hardest thing any actor will sort of have to sort of get over is that the minute you audition, the minute you sort of put it out there in the minute it's all done is the minute you got to forget about it. You have to be strong enough to know, you know, I did my best and that's it. I'm going to give you a pat on the back because I believe in you because I'm your agent, but yeah. you know, not in the casting and producers might not. So you have to say, yeah. all right, on to the next. <laughs> well, so how do you get to a point though where you're like, we're not booking anything, it's not working, and then you have to Does that ever essentially happen? let yes. that person go? And like, Absolutely. what's that like? Uh, it's not easy. <laughs> You know, we as agents invest a lot of time and our emotions sort of into clients too. And at some point we have to decide, you know, it's the business, you know, it's time to part ways and it's unfortunate. And look, I even get my own rejection. You know, I'll be honest with you. I had an instance just this week where I signed a client and a month later she dropped me out of nowhere for with oh. no reason whatsoever. You know, I, I too, you know, suffer my own reject. When my actors don't book, I also too sort of feel rejected. So rejected, you know, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So, but that's the thing, you know, at some point you sort of just expect it and it's sort of, you you do sort of become conditioned. You gave me yeah. such entourage vibes though and you're like, it's, yeah. the, it's the business. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, yeah. I mean, yes. some people have referred to me as the female Ari Gold, but we don't have to Because the no, minute I okay. do, I'll say, honey, it's time to wrap it up. I have a question for you guys. So I guess your industry is like you just take as many shots as possible, hoping that one finally lands, right? I don't know. I was reading about this earlier today and I was thinking about it and this idea of putting yourself out there for something like maybe it's a role or it's a title or it's a new job or it's like you're asking someone on a date and you just put yourself out there and then the idea is like you immediately just cut off all emotion that's tied to it right yep and I think like a big part of rejection is the disappointment that comes with maybe putting yourself out there and it not landing the way that you wanted it to how do you guys feel about this culture of trying something and putting yourself out there and then immediately having to turn yourself off because we're too afraid of the feeling of disappointment. Like, how do you guys feel about that? Is that healthy? Like, I know not for you, it's business. Yeah. And so you kind of have to do it because it's like a monetary thing, but like away from the monetary thing, like how do you guys feel about that just as people? Like, is that healthy to do that to ourselves? I don't think so at all. You know, I think part of, living in this world is adapting to 
being rejected, but also that sort of forms who you are. You know, I can't say I am who I am today because I didn't face some sort of rejection. So if yeah. I completely shut myself off every single time that, you know, I was rejected, you know, I wouldn't necessarily be who the person I am standing today. That's sort of just what life is. Life is sort yeah. of a big chunk of it is being rejected and sort of just picking yourself back up, you know. I think it's kind of important too. I think for me personally, like, I mean, honestly, even us doing this podcast yeah, was us putting ourselves out there. It's our personalities and, you know, everyone can say whatever they want to say about us. But like, if I sat there and really just got so upset about all the mean things that like, obviously there have been not nice things said. You know who you are. Hi, friends. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for streaming. A stream to stream. <laughs> stream anyway, to stream. Um, <laughs> if, I, if I sat there and dwelled on it, like, I don't know. I just stopped caring about, like, what other people think. And I don't think it's that healthy to, like, sit there and dwell on, you know, everyone else's opinion on what yeah. you're doing. Like, I guess – I'm not sure if I'm like answering the question correctly at this point. No, you, but- I think you are because you're you're saying that like even if when you put yourself out there, like even if disappointing news comes, like it there is some beneficial so, something beneficial does happen if you put up if you cut it off. No, if you put up that wall between you and the result, like if to use the podcast as another example, like. Obviously, people have been saying mean things in their own circles. Um, <laughs> but like, Love for it. instance, like we, Haley and Heather and I have talked about it and we're like, we're having just like actually so much fun doing this. And it's so fulfilling to us on an individual level that really anything that mean that anyone could say isn't really affecting us in the way it could. So – I don't know. I I do think that there is something beneficial that does happen by putting up an emotional wall and saying like, okay, I'm, I'm separating myself and not letting, and not letting myself feel as affected by the result of, or the outcome of something. Right. Because if you do, you will stop doing what you're trying to do. And for every one person that hates you, three people might love you. So you just keep- Sorry, I don't mean to cut in again, but like that's something that we've talked about. I've talked about extensively, at least like, and when I say talked about, maybe lectured my friends, but <laughs> like there is an audience for everything, and there's someone that's going to appreciate and relate to everyone. Like your story is valid. What is happening to you is valid. And you, as maybe an actor or in a person or anyone that puts yourself out there in any capacity, your experience, your education, whatever it is, you are valid. You just have to find the right fit. Yeah. And you're going to get a lot of no's and you might get a lot of hate until you figure out exactly where you fit. But you are never going to find out where you fit unless you keep trying. You wake up every day and say, this is my ultimate goal. Like, I'm just going to keep putting this out there. I'm just going to keep putting myself out there. Yeah. And I – to chime in, I think there's some sense of empowerment there too. You yeah, know, yeah, there's some of sense course. of like you, you sort of rejecting rejection in and of mm-hmm. itself is just a way of of saying to yourself like I don't care, you know what I mean? Like I'm going to continue to uh, press on with my endeavors regardless of sort of what's out there, you know, kind of canceling out the noise. You know, yeah. that's a sense of that's that's an, your own sense of indiv- individuality and almost mm-hmm. sort of formulates who you are as a person in, in and of itself. So, but you yeah. know what's so funny? You seem more interesting. Is yeah. that obviously a lot of that comes with age. Like I remember being super young and being at like my like dance lessons and my mom, like there were all the dance moms were like so like whatever. And my mom was like, I just remember her being like, I just don't care. Like I don't care about any of like they were so <laughs> clicky, whatever. Yeah. My mom was so like, whatever. Yeah. And she was like, and I remember just being like, Mom, stop it. <laughs> and she was like, trust me, when you reach a certain age, you just don't care anymore. And now I'm yeah. like, yep. 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 I, there. Think I might be at that age. <laughs> yeah. yeah. This is it. Like, yeah. Mom was right. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> Mom was right. All right. Well, should we get into our top eight? 
<gasps> yes. Let's do it. Nat, do you want to hit the first one? I know you brought a few for us. <laughs> I did bring a few for you guys today. I was kind of excited about it. Yeah, I know. <laughs> Natalie has really great suggestions. Yeah. Uh, um, I'll start with my new favorite face cream that I spent an arm and a leg yeah. on. Uh, yeah. The Tatcha Dewy Skin Cream is 11 out of 10. Is it? I yes. think I've had a sample. It's like pretty like nice and thick and good for like yeah. winter. Yes. I want to try it. Yeah, yeah, super good. Save is your, that the one? Save it your pennies. In, it comes in like a blue bottle or something. Yeah, it's like purple. It looks like an apple or something. It looks like an apple. It's got like a it's got like a little spoon with it. So you like take the spoon off and you like put that. it in and like I love like when it comes like little, little accessories. I love yeah. when the packaging is just pretty beautiful. Yeah. yeah. I love that. Worth every penny. Haley, do you have number two? Um sh- <laughs> yes. So I don't know who out there sent me this. Someone anonymously sent me this book called Lighter by Young Pablo. Oh. I got it. Your book. I Seriously? received it. So you have no idea who sent you that book? No. That's hysterical. So <laughs> I'm saying show your work. Show Someone your face. show up. Tell me who you are. I have but, like one guess of who it might be, and it's someone that's a fucking creepy man. <laughs> but, uh, ooh, I'm gonna hope it's not. But yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's funny. If you're listening, just know I read page one, and I was shooketh. Shooketh. I follow that author. He's good. Yeah, no, he is really good. But I, whoever did it, I think it was for a nice reason. And thank mm. you. Number three, um, I recently went to this art show here in San Francisco, and I bought this book. It's called Daily Self-Portraits from 1972 to 1973 by Mm -hmm. Melissa Shook. And I feel like it's like the – kind of like an OG kind of like Kim K selfie book, but Mm -hmm. this woman took selfies like every day. And I think as – modern youngish people we get a lot of shit for like taking selfies and wanting to document things every day but yeah the human inclination to document the things that are around us has been prevalent for centuries decades whatever like Mm -hmm. since i think since the beginning of mankind we've wanted to document the things that we see and what's going on around us and like our own lives like we feel like our own experiences are significant even if we're sharing it yeah, but even if it's just like our bodies and like we want to take a photo of it, we want to we want to just capture it, even if it's mm-hmm. not to share with anyone. I mean, maybe one day we'll end up in a coffee table book, but like maybe one day it won't. We just we take selfies and we document and we take pictures of what we eat and our pets and our kids and our surroundings and like we buy something we, new and we style it perfectly in our homes and we're like, oh my god, that's so cool, and we take or a we picture just of it. Video ourselves, talking. or we video ourselves. <laughs> This book and and others, it just goes to show that th- this is human nature and mm-hmm. in and of ourselves, our bodies and just waking up every day is art. Yeah, honestly. It's a memory. I mean, it really it, is. Honestly, it like, is. So, yeah. However anyways, you want to like artistically do it. This do book it. is great. If you want to order it, don't order it on Amazon. Resist. But I am going to link it on Amazon down below. So There you go. Number four. I feel like yours was deep. I, gotta- I always go deep. I always go deep. Uh, actually, I'll go deep too. Uh, I just finished Paris Hilton's memoir, Paris. I was pleasantly Love. surprised by the uh, how hilarious she is, how uh, much life this woman has lived. I love her, and <laughs> you know her business savvy and the whole the book it's i mean i i got it on audible so it was fun to just listen to her speak as well mm-hmm. so did she record it with her own voice she recorded it with her own voice oh, wow. and i the love tales her. the woman this woman has told and the fight that she has sort of had to fight on her own you know she she fully recognizes how privileged she was growing up but the the struggles that she too also kind of uh had herself while you know growing up in the early 2000s and you know kind of what her parents put her through was just yeah Mm -hmm. so it would you know i laughed i cried and i would recommend it to everybody well thank you natalie yes well i'm gonna sound shallow (laughs) (laughs) per usual here i come with the light one yeah um (laughs) 
Um, I don't know if you guys have watched Summer House. Yes. No. I am a big Summer House fan. I fucking am so obsessed with that show. Like, yes. I can't stop watching it. And like, yeah. I'm, I'm missing all the new episodes of the other shows that I watch yeah. because I'm binging that show. What's what's not to love about Summer House? It's it's seven of your best friends that you get into a house that you know play play in the pool and drink and it's like all real, the drama ensues. It's like the real world all over again, but like yes, like current exactly right. New York and like there's I feel like New York like East Coasters are so much more real about stuff like. Like where like West Coast will like kind of dance around like the problem. Yeah. Like East Coast people will just point it head out. On. Like it just <laughs> yeah. It's, it's so God, it's so good. Anyways. Yeah. Yeah. I love stand them. for that. I fucking love that show. Anyways, if you haven't watched it, you should. I am going to highlight a cocktail that I recently am Ooh. really a big fan of. Uh it's an older cocktail called the French 75. Um, I'm a big champagne drinker, so I wanted to find a, another type of champagne cocktail that could spritz up my uh, my drink portfolio, if you will. You're right. Uh, you know, I was like, you broke your dry January with that cocktail. Yes, I know. I'm, I'm like, like do you even do... drink anymore? What was that like? Yes. <laughs> I got. We're I like my... drowning over here. <laughs> We're like, I know. I finished well, my pinot. Like? What was? Uh, what was, <laughs> what was that like? <laughs> The, the Pinot or the French 75? No, oh, Rachel just goes, dry January. Oh, what's dry oh, dry January was horrendous. Goes, what was that like? <laughs> do not recommend. Do not pass. Sounds not horrible. Horrible. This is your third year in a row doing dry January, though. Uh, I mean, second. As yeah, friend did my third. Like third. That was, that was <laughs> actually a choice. <laughs> yeah. You yeah. chose to do that. So I mean, honestly, you feel really great, but it was the – it was a pretty long month and forever for whatever reason this was like the last year i was like oh this is fine like i didn't really have too many struggles in january there was a lot of struggles this january so, I, well yeah. you had a few uh, like, social settings <laughs> yeah no thank you yeah. but so i broke it with the french 75 and it's uh two ounces of gin uh an ounce of lemon juice a half ounce of a simple syrup and uh, you shake that all up and then you do a champagne float and you do a little lemon twist and it's chef's kiss. Yeah. Well, I'll so those gin drinkers out, out well, there. No, me and Rachel actually have become gin drinkers. Yeah. No, we're, we're learning. Person, <laughs> Number seven on our top eight is dim. If you suffer with like high estrogen, it's a supplement and it helps process. Okay. So I have like fibroids in my um titties so mm. they get really really fucking sore um throughout my cycle like uh, several times mm. a month they get really like painfully sore and so i have started taking dim and it helps and they don't hurt anymore so if you have yeah. sore titties take dim dim it down you <laughs> if you got the sore titties take dim take it i don't okay. have eight Natalie, you know, round us out. You have any titties to be sore, do you? <laughs> Actually, no. My, my, mine are good. <laughs> I love it. That's funny. Take us home, Natalie. What's up with number eight? All right. <laughs> Take us home, last, bitch. Last but not least are <laughs> the YSL uh, Calissa sunglasses in Havana that I'm like super Ooh. obsessed with. If I had like an extra $500 lying around. Although I'm sure you could probably find it for like half off or something at like off, off sacks off Saks Fifth or like what is it off the fifth um, Wait, we don't talk about that we, we, we not, don't. not on this podcast all right, we all don't. right. <laughs> some like discount some discount eyewear but uh it's the ys it's Sunglass the ysl card. 633 or 633 calista sunnies and they're just I like the it. perfect summer cat eye I love that. Juicy. Well, no <laughs> the audacity this week, but I'm pretty sure Haley and I will have a really good story for you guys after being in New York. Yeah. Just drinking more tea. About it. I'm going to be on time. We're going to just be fermenting the entire time. Like I have a feeling like I'm going to come home half fermented. Just Make like, sure you drink lots of water. No, Mom over going here. Happen. I'm going to book a few <laughs> commercials after this. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> I love it. I'm All right, come well, home a star. <laughs> Thank you so much for joining us, Heather. We missed you. Heather, and we missed you. 
We will see everyone next week. We love Thank you. Thank you for having me. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks for being here. Bye.